Hello everybody, and welcome to the Geoconservative channel. My name is Mr. Geocon. Sorry for the long wait, I have been busy. There's a lot of ideas I'm exploring right now, and I really want to get this video on Gendergate out soon. For now, however, I hope you enjoy this video. If you are interested in these topics, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you, and enjoy the video. This video is a response to Jack, the owner of the channel Economic Erudite. In a video entitled, Taxation is Theft, the complete debunking of tax morality, Jack claims to have proven once and for all that anarcho-capitalism is the one true religion, that the NAP is God, and that Murray Rothbard is its prophet. I'm being facetious, of course. Jack's video, while well made, is unoriginal. Many libertarians could watch it and agree with its overall reasoning, but it is unconvincing to those who aren't libertarians. The errors in Jack's video aren't unique to him either. In general, I find that this video is an excellent catalog of what I find wrong with the libertarian worldview, which is why I decided to respond to it. This way, I can just point to this video whenever I come across bad libertarian memes masquerading as moral arguments. Jack's argument against taxation can be summed up with the following syllogism. Premise 1. Using force to take something without legitimate consent is theft. Premise 2. Taxes use force to take something without legitimate consent. Conclusion. Taxation is theft. The first premise is simply assumed by Jack's definition of theft, while the bulk of his video is dedicated to defending the second premise. Jack first argues that the history of taxation shows it to be a human invention, not some force of nature. In order for taxation to be natural, he says, the state would have to be natural, and since it is impossible for the state to have existed since the dawn of time, it is impossible for it to be natural. I don't know what he means by this, however. Does he mean that the British state hasn't existed since the dawn of time? Or that the existence of the state as a modern institution is a new phenomenon? Or does he mean something else? In any case, Jack moves on to refuting the Lockean justifications for taxation. According to John Locke, all men are equal and independent, meaning that no man has authority over any other man. Because of this, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. This is the classic formulation of what is now called the Non-Aggression Principle, or NAP. Locke would then justify the state through the existence of the social contract. Taxation is justified, he says, because the people consent to the state's action when they enter into this social contract, i.e., when they live in society. Jack is a Lockean anarchist. He believes the non-aggression principle is the foundation of Western liberty and is the best possible measure of morality. But he, contra Locke, holds that consent cannot be given if the NAP has been breached. Citing the philosopher Spinoza, he compares consenting to state coercion to consenting to being robbed on the street, calling it delusional. He also rejects the idea that citizens of a state consent tacitly, citing compulsory public schooling as an example of the state not allowing people to opt out of using its services. Having proved the premises to be true, Jack concludes that taxation is theft. In the second half of his video, he goes on to answer utilitarian objections to his position. In answering these objections, Jack assumes an emotivist position. He asserts that arguing that anything is objectively good or bad, including taxation, is impossible and fallacious. He reduces the utilitarian claim that taxes are good and theft is bad to I like taxes and hate theft. Because taxation and theft rely on the same moral principles, to claim that the latter is objectively bad is to claim that the other is as well. Those who are pro-taxation and anti-theft 
are making an unprincipled distinction, and, more importantly, they are missing the point. The anti-tax critique is centered around how taxes are acquired, not how they are spent. It appears that this half of the video contradicts the first half, where he asserted that morality could be measured by reference to the NAP. If following the NAP consistently is not good, then why follow it at all? Why couldn't a utilitarian agree that taxation is theft, but say that theft isn't bad when it leads to good outcomes? As we will see later, these holes in Jack's argument are only the beginning. As stated before, Jack's argument relies on the idea that taxation is unnatural. He bases this on the unnaturalness of the state. Curiously, he provides no evidence for this assertion. Sure, he goes into a history of the origins of particular taxes, but not a history of the origins of states. There's a good reason for this. There has never been a society without a state in all of the recorded history. Anarchists often point to structures made during civil wars, like the CNT in Spain, or places with polycentric legal systems, such as medieval Europe, as examples of anarchism, but neither of these count as truly stateless societies. As Russell Kirk pointed out, the state is natural and necessary for the fulfillment of human nature and the growth of human civilization. Generally speaking, men possess a pre-rational desire to live in society. Humans are not atomistic individuals by nature. They naturally form bonds of friendship and family, and from this foundation the civil society is formed. Human beings also have the power of speech, one of the purposes of which is to propose what is expedient and just. The civil society is necessary to men because it is the only place where man can fulfill this potential in the fullest. However, in all societies, large and small, a leader must emerge to direct individuals towards the common good. This is necessary for two reasons. First, men have conflicting interests, and even if they were to agree on a goal, they'd inevitably argue amongst themselves on how best to achieve it, so some authority must be made the final arbiter. Second, men, on account of their natural weakness, have a tendency to decline in morals they intellectually agree with unless there is some authority to spur them into action. In order for there to be a society, some of its members must have authority over it. Because people naturally form civil societies, and because all societies need an authority, it seems as though political authorities are natural entities. If so, we must conclude that the state, the modern-day incarnation of political authority, is a natural entity as well. Libertarians can only object to this obvious fact by assuming some form of the social contract theory. According to this, pre-societal men, i.e. men in a state of nature, are all free and equal self-owners, and they then consent to becoming part of society. Society is not a natural entity, according to this view, but a human invention. The very obvious problem with this is, as David Hume pointed out, there is no record of this having ever happened. Furthermore, we have no reason to believe that this has ever happened. There is no such thing as a pre-society individual. We all came from families, which are complete societies of their own, and we can only make sense of concepts like freedom, rights, or property through the traditions of our society. There is no such thing as an individual without society, just as there is no such thing as a society without individuals. As the Catholic philosopher Luigi Tapparelli pointed out, there have always been individuals who've ruled over others by virtue of their superior characteristics, their valor, knowledge, wealth, etc. Though humans are equal in that they are members of the same species, they are unequal in their positions in society. So whoever can claim authority by virtue of their social standing and rule is a legitimate authority. Taparelli recounts how most 
primitive states grew out of the family unit, the most fundamental society. They were patriarchal states, states in which the head of the family was the ruler of the tribe. As the number of families in an area grew, the division of labor would increase the wealth of the community. But some families would gain more than others, causing this early quasi-egalitarian tribal system to give way to more aristocratic and monarchical forms of government. This account of the formation of states and how they gained legitimacy is a truer account than the social contract theory. In short, men need society, society needs a state, and if states need taxes, that means men need to be taxed. Another major problem lies at the crux of Jack's argument, that taxation and theft are identical. Jack had to change the definition of theft to suit his argument. To see what I mean, consider these four dictionary definitions of theft, then compare them to Jack's. Merriam-Webster defines theft as an unlawful taking of property. Oxford Learner's Dictionaries define it as the crime of stealing something from a person or place. Cambridge Dictionary defines it as the act of dishonestly taking something that belongs to someone else and keeping it. The Free Dictionary defines it as a criminal act in which property belonging to another is taken without that person's consent. And Jack's definition of theft is using force to take something without legitimate consent. Unlike Jack's definition, each of these dictionary definitions make reference to a legal system and to property rights. The traditional understanding of theft implied by these definitions assumes the existence of some moral and political order within which the thievery occurs. Jack's redefinition of theft removes the moral element of theft entirely, leaving only the part about forcibly taking something without consent. But for statists, theft is bad because it is unjust, not merely because it's done without consent. So when Jack argues with the tax morality, he is really just talking past his opponents. Furthermore, the traditional understanding of theft is stronger than Jack's understanding. To Jack, consent is the deciding factor in determining what is or isn't theft, but there are many instances in which victims of theft consent, such as a starving woman being forced to sell her wedding ring to buy food from a price-gouging vendor, or a drug addict being compelled by his addiction to purchase drugs from a drug dealer. Most people would consider these actions to be exploitative even if all parties involved consented to them. This is because we have an idea of what each party deserves, an idea of justice that comes from our moral framework. To see why a notion of justice is necessary, consider the following situations. Person A cuts open a sleeping man and removes the sleeper's internal organs. Person B chases a peaceful individual through the streets, pulls out a gun, and threatens him to hand over the wallet in their back pocket. Person C forces another man to give him the money the latter's earned after a hard day's work. At first glance, these should be clear-cut violations of the non-aggression principle, right? All of them involve what look in the abstract to be initiations of force, but it's ambiguous from this position whether or not these actions are immoral. Person A could be a serial killer or a surgeon. Person B could be a vicious robber or an ordinary citizen trying to get his wallet back from a pickpocket. Person C could be a mafia thug running a protection racket or a landlord collecting rent. We've abstracted away the characteristics of the people in question, and without this context, we cannot have a notion of what each man deserves. The very notion of the NAP requires a notion of objective goodness, a knowledge of what lies beyond the veil of ignorance. But according to Jack, to even provide a definition of goodness is fallacious. Jack's conception of morality is incoherent. 
he fails to take into consideration how fundamental justice is to understanding what is or isn't theft. Consent alone is insufficient. Jack may reply to the last point by saying that the NAP is the most fundamental part of any correct moral framework. This is the broad libertarian position. Libertarian ethics tend to replace the classical notions of justice with the non-aggression principle. To disprove libertarianism once and for all, I will contrast it with my own political position. When I talk about politics, I start with an account of the nature of goodness. Political philosophy is about the creation of a better state, and we cannot have a good state if we don't know what it means to be good. Political philosophy proceeds from ethics. My ethical views fall into the classical natural law tradition of Plato and Aristotle, which defines goodness as the perfection of being and evil a privation of the good. All things tend toward perfection in some way. Inanimate objects resist destruction, plants and animals strive to survive and reproduce, etc. All they desire is participation in what is eternal, what is godlike. As Aristotle said, everything acts for an end. So in the abstract, we can say that all things strive towards their perfection, to perpetuate themselves for eternity. In other words, being good means striving to become more godlike. The closer they are to this goal, the better they are. But what does this mean for individual things themselves? As the philosopher Peter Geech argued in his paper, Good and Evil, the meaning of good and bad depends on something's nature or function. For each individual X that belongs to a kind K, if X is good, then X is a good K, and if X is a good K, then X is good by being as K's ought to be. To give some examples, a triangle is a three-sided polygon whose angles add up to 180 degrees. So a triangle drawn with a ruler on a stationary desk will probably be better than a triangle drawn on the back of a moving bus. A pencil is a writing utensil. So a good pencil writes well, while a bad pencil does not write well. A doctor's role is to restore the health of his patients. So a good doctor performs this job properly, while a bad doctor does not. Whenever we call something good in this sense, we are saying that it is a properly functioning member of its kind. This objective understanding of goodness is not reducible to assertion of personal approval. To quote Geech, there is no such thing as being just good or bad, there is only being a good or bad so and so. This is natural goodness, goodness according to the nature of a thing. Moral goodness is a species of natural goodness that applies to the actions of free-willed creatures like humans. The purpose of a human being differs from those of other animals because they possess intellect, whose object is what a thing is. And this knowledge leads us to God himself, as St. Thomas explains. Quote, Final and perfect happiness can consist in nothing else than the vision of the divine essence. To make this clear, two points must be observed. First, that man is not perfectly happy so long as something remains for him to desire and seek. Secondly, that the perfection of any power is determined by the nature of its object. Now, the object of the intellect is what a thing is, i.e., the essence of a thing, according to De Anima. Wherefore, the intellect attains perfection in so far as it knows the essence of a thing. If, therefore, an intellect knows the essence of some effect, whereby it is not possible to know the essence of the cause, i.e., to know of the cause what it is, that intellect cannot be said to reach that cause simply, although it may be able to gather from the effect the knowledge of that the cause is. Consequently, when man knows an effect and knows that it has a cause, there naturally remains in the man the desire to know about the cause, what it is. 
and this desire is one of wonder and causes inquiry, as is stated in the beginning of the metaphysics. For instance, if a man, knowing the eclipse of the sun, consider that it must be due to some cause, and know not what that cause is, he wonders about it, and from wondering proceeds to inquire, nor does this inquiry cease until he arrive at a knowledge of the essence of the cause. If therefore the human intellect, knowing the essence of some created effect, knows no more of God than that he is, the perfection of that intellect does not yet reach simply the first cause, but there remains in it the natural desire to seek the cause, wherefore it is not yet perfectly happy. Consequently, for the perfect happiness, the intellect needs to reach the very essence of the first cause, and thus it will have its perfection through union with God as with that object in which alone man's happiness consists, as stated above." Unquote. The nature of man requires that his mind become godlike in order to become good qua man, and this requires the most intimate knowledge of God, the source of all things. From this, it may appear to follow that abstract speculation on the creator deity would be necessary to be a good man. But while St. Thomas does hold the contemplative life of the metaphysician or the monk in the highest regard, this does not bar those called to a more active life from achieving true happiness. See, according to the classical view of God, God's goodness contains within himself the goodness of all things because he is their cause. All of creation is but a mere reflection of his goodness. One could say that he put a bit of himself into his work. Now, the primary way men learn is through hands-on experience. The armchair philosopher is said to be a less reliable authority than the observant field investigator for this reason. Therefore, knowing God involves much more than armchair speculation. It involves a hands-on experience of God through his creation. It follows, then, that knowing God requires the cultivation of a unity of human goodness, an ethic encompassing the life of a person. All aspects of human life should be directed towards this end, not merely to prepare us for some afterlife, but to have unity with God in this life as well. This would obviously include our lives as members of a civil society. Earlier, we acknowledged that the protection of the civil society is the purpose of the state, which is natural and necessary for the good of individuals. Thus, being a good member of the civil society is necessary to being a good man. And to maintain the unity of goodness, the gap between being a good citizen and being a good person in other respects should be as narrow as possible. Therefore, the common good of politics is not simply protecting society, but creating a virtuous, harmonious community, a society in which all its members work together to pursue God. The common good of the civil society is the justifying principle of the state. This is the fundamental assumption of natural law communitarianism, the political position I hold. Now, I can think of three critiques that a libertarian like Jack would make towards the position I've laid out here. First, he would say that natural law communitarianism must consider the individual and his self-interest before the good of the society in order to know what is justice for the individual is the truest, most fundamental unit of society. Second, the NAP is the best measure of morality, and is therefore the most fundamental moral rule. And third, the political common good is a mere abstraction. However, not only do all of these critiques fail, their failures expose the fundamental flaws in libertarianism. In the first critique, Jack might insist that since the individual is the most fundamental unit of society, we must consider individual rights and individual self-interest first and foremost. Therefore, violations of the NAP, like murder, theft, rape, extortion, and fraud, the most direct threats to individual self-interest, 
are more important than other concerns like the political common good. But as I demonstrated earlier, to know whether something is a violation of the NAP requires an idea of justice, an idea of the good. What is good for each person is only made sensible to them by a proper understanding of goodness itself. A proper understanding of the good requires a unity of goodness in all aspects of a person's life, including their role in society. But in order to know one's role in society, there must be social cohesion to begin with. For this reason, Aristotle claimed that friendship is more important than justice. Justice presupposes the existence of society, which in turn requires friendship, or social harmony, among its members. In his second critique, Jack might assert that the NAP is still the best measure of morality based on our intuitions, but this is misleading. The NAP only seems intuitively correct because its enforcement is necessary for maintaining social harmony, and its violations can only be done by authority figures acting in the name of preserving this social harmony. Common goods like social harmony trump the private goods of individuals because attaining a good shared by all is better and more godlike than attaining the good of a single individual or even a majority of individuals. This is why the same intuitions that commend the NAP fail to apply it consistently to the operations of the state. In addition, an emphasis on the NAP that ignores the importance of friendship inevitably leads to condoning antisocial behaviors. To see this, look no further than those most consistent followers of libertarianism, the Mises Institute. In The Ethics of Liberty, Murray Rothbard deduced that parents had the right to neglect their children. Meanwhile, Walter Bloch spun moral justifications for various criminal activities like blackmail or littering in his book Defending the Undefendable. And today, if you search the Mises Institute's website for the term Ebenezer Scrooge, you will find no less than nine separate entries on how Scrooge's miserliness in A Christmas Carol was actually admirable. Jack cannot justify the NAP as a measure of morality based on intuitions if some of its most consistent followers would morally condone behavior those very intuitions deplore. Finally, with his third critique, Jack might point out that the term common good is a justification used by tyrants throughout all of history. Since it's an abstraction that cannot be boiled down to any one person's good, it could only mean, in practice, the vision of the anointed. However, it is the libertarian's notion of freedom that is the actual abstraction. Things like friendship and community are real. We have real experience of these things in our day-to-day -day lives. Things like freedom, if they have any real existence at all, require order to exist and do not make sense outside of an ordered society. In reality, freedom is an abstraction that can be used to justify anything. We know what it means when we say that a community has social cohesion, but to say that a community has freedom requires elaboration. If we were to compare natural law communitarianism with libertarianism, we'd find that the former is far more consistent with how actual societies have formed historically. Natural law communitarianism explains the nature of goodness, the nature of institutions like the state, and our various moral intuitions. By contrast, libertarianism seems to be a rigid, impractical philosophy, as Jack himself admits at the end of his video. Jack desires to insert these ideas into the discourse to encourage critical thinking, but it's difficult to see how this philosophy could do any good should it become more popular. It justifies itself with fictions, has a nonsensical ethical framework, and is antisocial in its orientation. Quite frankly, we'd be better off without it. In short, Jack's attempt to debunk the tax morality not only fails to take into account fundamental things like the nature of goodness or the importance of social harmony, it actively works against these things on a broad level by condoning antisocial behavior. 
Though Jack does a good job debunking the Lockean justifications for the state based on social contract theory, he fails to debunk any non-liberal justifications for taxation, and his emotivism undermines most of his argument. To reject his argument, all one has to do is accept that goodness objectively exists, that hierarchies are natural and good, and that the political common good is more important than some abstract notion of freedom. I'll end this video by extending an invitation to Jack to come onto my channel to defend his arguments. I would also like to extend a challenge to any libertarian YouTubers who want to defend libertarianism to respond to this video. For the rest of you out there, thank you for watching, and have a nice day. Goodbye.